Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD's CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Aaron Miri. Mr. Miri is Senior Vice President and Chief Digital and Information Officer at Baptist Health. He brings over 20 years of healthcare and technology experience, driving growth and innovation within provider and commercial healthcare enterprises, and significant collaborative efforts with state and federal representatives. He's been recognized many times for his leadership and innovation, has received several prestigious awards, and serves on the boards of prominent organizations such as Chime, the Commonwealth Health Alliance, Dell Technologies, and various startups and BC Corps. Mr. Miri, Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alan, for having me. Appreciate you guys. And thanks, Josh, for having me as well. Absolutely. Aaron, I mentioned just before we hit record, but you are one of the most recommended guests we've ever had on the show. And so we are so grateful to have you on today. You've had such a diverse career. You've been on all sides of the healthcare proverbial table. You've played an active role in shaping policy and have been instrumental in leading transformational change within healthcare really for everyone. So to start the conversation, though, I wanted to understand what got you into tech in the first place. Great question. So honestly, my background is software developing. So I started developing at a very young age using COBOL and Pascal, if you remember those languages from back in the day. I graduated to C and eventually C Sharp, and I was writing code, and I was actually enjoying it. And what was interesting is, you know, you always go to school and you kind of pivot between what you wanted to do. As I actually started off in medical school, but my passion was coding. So I found myself coding on the weekends, developing software and writing website design, some stuff in ASP and VB and others. And I said, you know, I love the medical stuff, but let's go into coding and do that hardcore and really go into CS the way it was supposed to be CS. And I just got a thrill out of it. And why? Because you were always given a problem statement and you get it to create and imagine how to solve this thing in a way that's manageable, easy to use, et cetera, et cetera. Then try to break your own code and do all kinds of weird stuff with your software and say, okay, how do I make this thing error out? I love that, right? So for me, tech was all about getting into the code, getting into re-engineering, process engineering, and coming out with a solution that everybody could use. So fast forward, I graduate college. I also started working for a cable company that writing software. I wrote one of the first tool systems to help track the tools. Cause back in the day, before there was digital cable, you had little cylinders that you would put on the cable lines, to tell you what channels you got. So if you bought HBO, you'd have a cylinder. If you had show, showtime, whatever. And those things ended up falling out of the truck or falling off people's waist when they were like climbing poles and whatever else. So we did create an inventory system. So I did all of that which eventually, interestingly enough, led to an opportunity at a major health system in Dallas, Texas at the time, saying, hey, we're doing this thing called digitizing our records. Will you kind of help us do that? And I'm like, what does a software developer have to do with medicine? But remember, I had been in medical school back in the day. So I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting construct. Let's marry the two together. Fell in love with healthcare tech, fell in love with it. And I'll tell you, at the end of the day, now where I sit in my vantage point, it's just as thrilling and interesting and complex as writing software except now I'm leading teams of software developers doing the same thing. So long way to answer your question, I got into tech because it's my passion. I got into tech because I enjoy tinkering. And I got into tech, honestly, because I'm able to help people do something faster, easy, better, smarter, cheaper. You know, there are a lot of uh, developers kind of stay as individual contributors and are just like amazing, amazing engineers. I think relatively quickly, it feels like you moved into leadership yeah. and management. Why did you end up taking that path? Yeah, so great question. So for me, I, you could probably tell based on my personality, I'm very much an extrovert people person. So as much as software development was fun, I really like talking to people. And so there was a while there, I said, well, maybe I should be a product manager, right? Where I'm working with folks to figure out how to process engineer and product engineer, but I still liked tinkering. I still liked doing the coding myself. So interestingly, an opportunity opened up when I had moved over to that health system in Dallas to say, hey, do you want to manage a team of people that were coding? A small four person team, do you want to be a team leader, then manager, et cetera, et cetera? And I was like, yeah, sure. I thought it was awesome to then start dealing with how do I help enable these folks to become better? How do I help them through their challenges, get them more training? Of course, I'm, I was kind of like a player coach, you know, like I would, I would still manage them, but I would also then jump in and do some of it myself. So I found myself getting the thrill out of all starting to engineer people and helping them become more productive and working with them to really be happier, right? If you're spending eight, 10 hours, 12 hours a day at work, the one thing you want to make it, it's a fun environment where it's not like, oh gosh, I got to go to work every day. So for me, it was about finding that what's in it for me component and making the job fun and watching people grow up. One of the best things that I have found in just leading folks 
it's watching somebody that says, I oh, mean, I don't know if I could jump that far or make that leap. And I'm like, I know you can do it. I believe in you. You got it. And suddenly they do it. And they're like, Eureka. And I said, I told you so. It, it's it's such a joy for me. It's almost just like how I'd write software and I get the prompt at the end of the day or the answer spit out or whatever it would do that I wanted it to do. It's that same thrill, just you don't have to deal with missing a semicolon or an erroring out, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, once you get through all the bugs and the errors, then, exactly. then that's part of the fun, yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Seamless MD, which enables health systems to digitize patient care journeys, leading to lower lengths of stay, readmissions, and costs. Josh, you used to be a doctor. Did you ever feel like patients showed up unprepared for surgery? Or maybe you felt like you were sending patients into a black hole after discharge? All the time. You know, we give patients paper and verbal instructions, which are so easy to forget and really hard to follow. And we have no idea what happens to them outside the hospital. So what happens? Well, because we worry about them, we keep patients in hospital longer, but that drives up length of stay and lowers throughput. Plus, after they leave, patients get readmitted for infections and all kinds of problems that we could have just caught earlier if we monitored patients. What if I told you there was a way to give every patient a virtual companion so you could automatically engage and monitor them through a surgery, a cancer journey, or a chronic care journey, and drop the length of stay, increase throughput, and lower readmissions? Gosh, Alan, that would be amazing. So that is exactly what Seamless MD does. It allows health systems to engage patients on their own phone, tablet, or computer with automated reminders, education, and symptom monitoring. Basically a GPS through any healthcare journey. That sounds fantastic, but does it actually work? It does. Health systems have done over 40 studies and evaluations showing how they use the solution to reduce length of stay by one to two days, readmissions by up to 89%, and costs by over $1,000 per patient. Huh, but how does that work with my EHR? That's the best part. Seamless MD is the only solution in this space with direct integration partnerships with Epic and MyChart, Oracle Cerner, and Meditech. Huh. Well, you know, I am getting a colonoscopy soon, so I really need something like this. Where can my health system learn more? Well, Josh, thanks for letting me know. Your health is very important, and endoscopy is just one out of the 50-plus out-of-the-box care plans available today on Seamless MD. Go to www.seamless.md. That's www.seamless.md to learn more. So, Aaron, I've heard in one of your interviews, you mentioned thinking of the organization as a product company. How does that mindset influence your approach to healthcare IT and what benefits does it bring to Baptist? Great question, Alan. So we did. We reorganized Baptist Health. So I'll just talk about my current shop. So I'm at Baptist Health here in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we reorganized our IT department around product and productization. So we literally have teams that develop net new products to be internally used. So we don't commercialize, but internally used, right? So we've built education apps. We've built an eye-washing station app. We've, bought, we've, we've built a number of things. In fact, we've embraced citizen development where we're yeah. teaching our physicians and nurses how to develop their own code using a low-code platform. And then we've also productized in terms of what are we supporting, right? There's major pieces of equipment we spend tens of millions of dollars on that need their own lifecycle management product roadmaps, working with the respective vendors. So then we do some add-ons ourselves, but then we expect them to do various tweaks to make Baptist Baptist, right? So when you start organizing by product, what you realize is you have teams of people, just like when you develop a product for sale and commercialization, but then manage the lifecycle management of each of the components and work with your end users, your consumers, to make sure that the product actually is doing what you said it was gonna do and the features and functionality actually do enable them to achieve XYZ outcome. So what's it done for us here is now I can measure truly what the return on investment is for IT resources, labor, non-labor, uh, application spend, and what are we doing so that when someone says, what am I getting for the dollar? What am I actually achieving? And what's the net ROI? Even though we're not selling the product on the market per se, where there's a easily tangible, hey, we've got this pipeline and our, our QBRs, our quarterly business reviews say X, Y, and Z, and our sales for forecast is X, we can actually say the value derived, we're able to see more patients, get patients out of a hospital faster. We're able to do X, Y, and Z, which is just as valuable had I taken that product and sold it you know, wherever and made money in returns. So the value component, I'm able to instantiate and articulate clearly to our executive team and our board and say, here's what you get for your dollar. Here's where it's netting. And here's what the return on investment is. And if you up the investment, you get this. If you lower the investment, you get this. It should just be like a product you would sell. That's awesome. Can I ask you, I know like some folks, when they develop new products or do innovations in the health system, they kind of measure ROI initially. Sure. And then they kind of assume, you know, that's all we need to do. We should keep doing this. 
some folks say, well, we should measure the ROI, you know, year after year because maybe it, it declines over time or it's, it's less valuable. How do you think about that? And, and by the way, it takes time and resources to look at the data again and remeasure the ROI. So there's a trade-off there too. It is. And it's also in healthcare, as you know, there's many moving parts. So example, right, reducing length of stay is a major initiative for the health system. That's a very easy thing to do. You're like, well, just to discharge the patient faster. Well, there's a lot. You've got to have availability of nurses. You've got to have physicians. You've got to have sign off about, are the meds ready to go for discharge? Are your discharge instructions clear? All these pieces operationally. So when we say, did IT help reduce length of stay across the health system by our goal is half a day, how am I going to measure that, right? So to your point, it's not just continuous measurement of ROI, it's different data points of ROI that lead into the ultimate, did you reduce length of stay by half a day? If you reduce length of stay by half a day, you basically created a capacity of about 40 beds roundabouts, right? Without having to build anything. And you've made patients a lot happier because guess what? They went home faster. That's what reduced length of stay is. Like get out, go home. Like you're better. We got you better. We got you, you know, well faster. Go and you're happier. So there's all these dimensions that you measure to do that. So we do continuous ROI measurement. Uh, we do actually forecasting of where we're going. We report that back to our executive team of what are we achieving? So it's not just IT componentry, it's all the pieces operationally that IT sits there as a dyad at the table with each service line and says, how are we enabling you to do your objective? So your cardiology, maybe you wanna make sure that your electrophysiology or your EP visits go faster, or you're able to uh, have a lex complexity for the day or whatever it may be. Did you achieve that and what IT pieces did that? I'll give you an example specifically. So one of the things that the health system wanted to do was very much move to the open table concept where people can self-schedule, right? Open schedule their own times. Being, I have a cough, I don't know what's going on with me, I wanna find a primary care doctor and I wanna choose a time. Just like you would choose a table, an open table, right? At your favorite restaurant. That's a difficult thing to do because schedules, templates, uh, availability, all the physicians are at full max capacity. So how do you uh, open up schedules for maybe your, your mid-levels, your advanced practitioners? Those decisions have to be made then you got to make sure that the, the patient experience is good, right? The UX, it makes sense. And it's easy for somebody with a basic comprehension of technology to do that, just like open table or ordering an Uber. So you have to work through all these iterations and measure each data point across the continuum to say, did I actually achieve this? And yes, now we have open scheduling enabled. We just went live. We're actually still rolling it out. We just went live with adult cardiology. Within the first hour, 13 people immediately used open scheduling right off the bat. And, and now it's just skyrocketing as the community is being made more aware, like, hey, you don't have to call us, just go on our app and, and schedule it yourself. So that is measurement of ROI. That's direct ROI of what we're doing. And it's always being reported back so that we're measuring, monitoring, and maintaining where we're going. I will also say this, because of the practicality of the way we measure ROI and because we're organized as a platform, infrastructure, and application, and IT side of the house, I'm able now to look at and say, adjustment over year over year, how are we doing on our margins and how are we doing from a business sense? We are doing well at Baptist Health. We're not immune to the headwinds of inflation and others, but we're doing well in spite of that because we are monitoring and maintaining active partnership with operations. And anytime an adjustment needs to be made because of whatever headwinds are occurring for that respective unit, be it inventory shortage of X, Y, and Z because of materials issues, we can adjust the IT pieces to see actively how did we deal with and mitigate whatever that risk is. That is ROI. That's active IT. That's partnership at the table. And above all else, the one thing I do not hear because we're organized this way is, oh, you guys sit in the back office and make and tinker with toys and make things work. That does occur, but that is a sliver of the giant pot of pie, which is we're helping to grow the business, we're helping to generate revenue, and most importantly, helping with better patient outcomes and quality. That's what we're in the business of doing. I mean, to your point, I feel like there's been a shift in understanding that maybe 20 years ago, IT really was in the back room, but now you're really an, an enablement partner to get true business transformation and outcomes. I mean, there's no choice but to use tech. To, That's to true. And, and Josh, you can appreciate this. So we're one of the early adopters on really building AI prompts using a large language model for our patients to respond to patient-generated notes and inquiries, right? Um, we have a team, a small army of practitioners, physicians, active physicians in our medical staff who are more than happy to start coding and building the prompts. I literally sat with them this morning. I'm like, guys, what makes you tick? Like, this is awesome. But you also have a day job. We're just seeing these full panels of physicians, of patients. They're like, Aaron, this is what we want to be doing. We want to make it simpler to, to have new medicine. We want to spend less time on the administrative overhead and burden. 
We want to make our patients happier. And by gosh means, we want to make sure that we are the cutting edge of knowing the latest cool stuff. So to that point, tinkering is still there, air quotes, but it's helping enable your consumers, your providers, your practitioners to be able to tinker. So it's not just me sitting in the back room tinkering, building up AI prompts. My physicians are doing so. And that is super exciting to watch that transition happen as well. It's almost like you're building an ecosystem for innovation right right side the health system, right with the frontline staff. It go. You you hit the nail on the head. Amazing. So Aaron, I actually heard a story where you once printed out on paper your entire tech stock for the board to see as a way to help them visualize all the redundancies and duplicative systems across your entire stock. Could you share the story behind that and maybe sure. some of the work you've accomplished so far in consolidating and streamlining operations? Yeah, great, great question. So it's interesting when you when you come into an organization, I've been a Baptist now about two and a half, going on three years now. Phenomenal story organization, been here 65 years in the community. Jacksonville is a blossoming market, growing about 100 people a day moving here. So when you have a health system that's doing well, that is growing, there tends to be a little bit more liberal funding going around so that folks can buy things. And if you have service lines that are growing with very intelligent leaders and practitioners, they want certain things. And you end up with two or three of the same thing when you look at it at a macro level. Well, how do you visualize that? How do you demonstrate back to the executive team and the board of directors, this is where we're going to go in terms of starting to consolidate and collapse and streamline and reorganize into platforms like we talked about already, but make it a way that it becomes real because you're going to be explaining to folks that don't really understand what uh, enterprise resource planning system is, the difference between that and electronic health record, right? And that's okay. They shouldn't, but they do understand when you put something tangible in front of them that here is the landscape of everything. And by the way, here's the dollar amount that it costs. And this is where we're going to go to and what we should expect. So we start off with about 1,600 apps, give or take. I'm rounding. Uh, these are main departmental apps, uh, enterprise applications. I'm not talking about the onesie twosie on departments. I put them on this giant piece of paper. It literally went end to end in a conference room. So think of your large scale board of directors conference table that's probably 50 foot long, right? It hung off of that. I had to get me and two other VPs to hold it because you know when you have something that long, it begins to fold over. We put it in front of the full board. I said, let me show you what IT looks like today. Let me just show you with all of our hospitals, with all of our applications, with all the service lines, what it takes to do today, where we're going to go. Because at that point, we're rolling out a new electronic health record. And then I showed him a snapshot of, let me delete these 500 boxes because each application was represented by a box and show you now what the new landscape looks like in 18 months. So we did exactly that. In about the past 24, 30 months or so, we've gotten rid of about 500 applications. Uh, I'm trying to get rid of another 500 over the next 24 to 36 months and consolidate our application tech stack to maybe, maybe around five or 600 total apps for the health system, maybe somewhere in there. Now, as any clinician other understand, there are certain things you have to have you just can't get rid of, right? There's certain apps that you know, no matter how much I want to consolidate into our electronic health record, you simply can't because we do things a little different in terms of the way we service our area. We have elderly care. We have our pediatric. Uh, we're level one trauma for pediatric. We have also the adult care. So a full integrated delivery network combined with some of the other tax, some of the tax IDs that we have under the Baptist Health umbrella, like home health and others have nuances that they do that it's difficult to get rid of every app. So call it five or 600 where we should land at of the 1500, 1600 that we were at initially. And also to that point, I'm able to retrain my staff. I didn't say reduce, retrain them on more advanced things and supporting this legacy app still running on Windows 2003 that no one wanted to get rid of and no one asked to get rid of years ago. Now they can focus on building AI prompts. They can become a DevOps engineer. They can worry about enterprise architecture. They can do these modern things. I can make them to a Python programmer. All these things that they didn't think they could do before because they simply didn't have the capacity and the availability of time to do it. You know, so I think objectively, folks will understand um, why there, there needs to be consolidation of your applications and whatnot. But when it's your application, if I'm the clinician who brought this one in, okay. then it gets personal. And so when you're, you know, cutting 500 of them, that's a lot of feathers you might be ruffling. I'm kind of curious, how do you manage that conversation? How do you maintain that rapport with someone that you've kind of taken their maybe their baby away from them? Sure, great question. So uh, it is a lot of conversation. It's a lot of facts, right? Clinicians, practitioners, I don't want to just pick on physicians, practitioners are very evidence-driven individuals. That's the way they're trained. You can appreciate this, Josh. This, it's done by repetition and done by evidence first, right? If the data isn't there and I can't trust the data, right? I can't poke at it and ask questions. 
then I'm not willing to do something. So that was why it was important. Everything from visualization all the way down to the tangible, hey, physician X, here's what's going on with your app. It is on a uh, operating system. Let's make this up. Operating system that's been out of date for 10 years. It will be hacked and you and your medical licensure will be at risk. And I don't want that. Here's how I can help you and take you to a newer app that does the same functionality, which I want you to clinically verify for me. It's cheaper, better, faster, smarter. And by the way, we're not jeopardizing your license. Those conversations have to happen one by one by one together with other clinicians. So in my IT team, I have numerous physicians that also do locum on the side. So they'll see patients on the weekend or whatever else. So it's a physician to physician conversation. It's somebody who understands and I have pediatric leaders, adult hospitals leaders. I have mental health leaders. I have rehab leaders. I have, I have clinicians and practitioners, both physician, nurses, APRNs, others that sit at every spectrum. So as we have those conversations with their counterparts and they're all on medical staff, they're all on staff. It's a conversation among peers with data, with transparency, and it's a conversation. I didn't say I'm hundred percent successful. There are times where I have to really have a long conversation. It takes a lot of time. That's okay. But I'll tell you that if you go with evidence first, you seek first to understand, you respect the position of the practitioner, you listen to what they're saying, and you engage them the way they want to be engaged together hand in hand, nine times out of 10, you're successful because nobody wants to really be obstinate. The reason they're obstinate is because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of good data, the practitioner will always side with the patient and provide the best quality. And if they know they've been giving good quality with this old app from 2003, they're going to stick with it because they don't yet trust and understand what you're trying to get accomplished. I love that. You, you appeal to what matters to them. And in this case, like it's, it's often the evidence, it's right. the clinical relevance, and that makes a ton of sense. Can I ask you, so I had the privilege of uh, seeing you speak at, at Becker's again this year. And on one of the sessions, you mentioned um, you know, this topic around like, well, should we wait for the EHR to build it or should we go with a third party? And, and I think I'm, I'm just paraphrasing what you said, but you said something like, if the EHR says, well, we're at least something similar, maybe you wanted two years, you know, should we wait and, and see or buy a third party? Your answer was, well, it depends on whether you want to leave some business outcomes on the table for a whole right. year and take the right. chance that it'll actually come in a year from the EHR. That's probably the most practical advice that I've heard on this topic. And so, you know, when a lot of folks are consolidating solutions, I'm kind of curious, can you pack your broader framework for how do you decide, you know, whether you should hope the EHR roadmap comes in soon enough versus choosing to partner with third parties? So great question, Josh. So a few things. Number one, an EHR is an EHR, right? Don't expect your electronic health record to be an enterprise resource planning record or to be a data warehouse and data mart. Don't expect that. It is a important spoke on the wheel, but it is not the whole kit and caboodle. So that's first. Make sure you understand what sandbox these various major pieces of equipment, these platforms play in. So that's number one. Do you understand the ecosphere there? Two, if it's a feature or something that the EHR says is on their roadmap, great, let's hear it out. But remember something in healthcare. We are transitioning from the long tooth, everybody's like the sales cycles on IT are 18 months, 24 months, to speed to value. Because of the need for efficiency and effectiveness in care, you know that saying cash is king by CFOs, very popular cash is king? Now speed is king in addition to cash. So if you have the opportunity to partner with a startup or somebody or an existing third party to get value quicker, by gosh, go get value quicker now because your health system needs it. The days of double digit margins and you know CARES funding are gone and I guarantee it'll never happen again. So you're gonna have to start thinking like an entrepreneur and thinking like a startup. Startups don't wait. Startups do whatever it takes to land their customers to bridge between an A round and a B round. And I love startups for that, right? They're hungry, they wanna make a difference. You as a technologist digital leader have to make the same assertions. Now, if it is some vendor who's promising you snake oil that has nothing there, beware, right? Don't go buying into the hype of, oh, this AI tool will solve all your problems. No, it won't. But if you need speed to value, which we all do, then you have to do that calculus to say, do I really want to wait a year or two for the promise of something? Because that EHR vendor may get distracted because they're doing EHR vendor things or some you know CMS mandate comes out that takes up all their bandwidth. Or... Am I going to start up partner with XYZ startup or company to get the value immediately? And then if that feature comes in on the EHR, okay, we'll make the transition down the road. 
but I didn't leave money on the table. I didn't leave value on the table. That is such an important calculus that technology leaders have to take into account. Too many people these days are still relying on the old, I'm going to believe in the iron box in the sky and my EHR vendor tells me this, and I'm going to do exactly what they tell me to do because that's safe and I won't get fired. Guess what? Those days are over. If you cannot deliver value immediately for your CFO, COO, and CEO, you're not going to be in this chair much longer. I guarantee you that. And I guess on the other side of it too, as the startup, I mean, you get your foot in the door maybe more quickly because you can deliver on speed. Yep. But if the EHR does eventually compete down the road, well, in some ways that's probably healthy for the market because the startup has to be held to an even higher bar to deliver. And they keep innovating. And they keep innovating, right? They don't become a one-trick pony. That startup now starts acquiring other companies or starts building different products and different features. There are a zillion problems to solve in healthcare, right? Just because I start with one solution, so what? Somebody cro creates a better widget, create a different widget, keep going, right? That innovative nature is exactly what it is. And who knows? Maybe you'll be bought by the EHR vendor, right? There could be a great strategic outcome from this whole thing. So net, net, I highly encourage, and I love the startup community for this, keep going, go faster, go harder. And the CIOs out there and the CIOs coming in, replacing the dinosaurs, get this mindset of speed to value. Do you think we'll eventually see stars you know, to compete directly with the big EHRs? Because one, of, I think one of my concerns is there's, I guess, let's call it three major players in the provider space for health systems, you know, Epic, Cerner, Meditech. And we've seen, let's call it, declines in, in, in the Cerner market share and in Epic's, I guess, winning a lot of the major, large <laughs> academic health systems. And so on the one hand, like you don't want to be that health system that picks the up and comer just because no one else is. On the other hand, like you kind of want competition for your big EHR. So like, how do we make sure there's strong competition in the future for that market? Well, I would challenge you on that, that. Why do you think there's a market for EHRs in five years anyways, right? <laughs> how is it not just a commodity at this point and table stakes and that folks are sick and tired of spending 200, 300, 400, 500 million dollars to make a switch? So if I'm a startup right now, I'm not thinking about EHRs. I'm thinking about what's next. Don't go after a, a environment that's pretty much saturated and, and honestly, it's table stakes. Go after the stuff they don't do, the high-end throughput analytics, the stuff that everybody needs that they just can't pivot fast enough to get done. And I mean, no disrespect to the EHR vendors. I know the executives of all three of the ones you spoke and others, they are phenomenal, brilliant people, but EHRs are EHRs. That's a sandbox they play in, right? That's what they do when they do well. They're not going to do the stuff on the outside that is almost as important, if not more important, to providing patient care and patient well-being and delivering results. So if I'm that startup, consider the downstream knock-on type things you need to do and focus on where we're going. Everybody's talked about this. We're leaving the four walls, whatever. It is discharging the home. It is ambulatory care. So think about why do you think Best Buy pivoted and one of their fastest growing segments is their home service model, right? going in, helping that hospital home patient, all those things, brilliant move by Best Buy, by a big box retailer. They didn't go build an EHR. They said, we're going to own this thing and do it really, really well. And you have numerous health systems partnering with them. Thumbs up. Then you have others like Walgreens and others who are, who are now saying we are exiting primary care because that's just not our bread and butter. Because guess what? That market was saturated and there's no margin in primary care. So we have to think differently and I wouldn't say compete with the HR vendor. I would say go be better than them doing something really, really well and solving a problem through a straw. Okay. And I guess, sir, to your point, if we imagine 100, 200 years from now, if we are as successful with consumerism and wellness and preventive care, then there actually may be fewer hospitals in the future, but there may be a bigger market in home and community care. That's exactly and right. That's, I mean, I hope there are fewer hospitals. That means we've done a better job of getting people well, right? And we're seeing that large rural population on a, on a level that's tangible and making material effect. I hope for this for this society that there are fewer hospitals, that we are a be better, more healthier society. And we deal with some of the other issues which have been left, unfortunately, awry, which is mental health, mental well-being, these, the issue of pandemic of loneliness, these issues that have not been reimbursable, so we're not going to go tackle them. They need to be tackled because that's what's affecting this country and the world in a grandiose way. Technology companies can get in front of that now. There's funding available, right, to make and tackle these issues and more coming is what CMS and CMMI tell us. So the reality is we need people who are creative and hungry to solve those challenges and make it easier so that 
the hospitals, as they continue to consolidate, and hopefully, as I said, there's less of them in the future, they're able to discharge people home and healthily, and we have a better society because of it. So Aaron, speaking of thinking outside of the box and unique approaches for the future, you're also one of the only CDIOs I know who has actually mentioned blockchain with a viable use case around identity management and yep. a master patient index leading to the golden record, as you put mm -hmm. it. It's built on a zero trust framework, but I'm wondering if you can unpack that idea for us, maybe at a high level, like what is zero trust and how do you envision that maybe happening in the future? Yeah, so zero trust, great question, Alan. So zero trust is exactly as the name says, that you're going to question and interrogate every level of authentication and access the data, the data model, the output, how it's accessible. It is a comprehensive approach towards ensuring security, which is you don't actually take for granted or assume anything, right? So assertion is only done after meeting every dimension and criteria of trust, right? And it goes be well beyond the NIST 800-52 standards and 53 standards. It goes well beyond all of that, right? It's it's think of it for the for the techno geeks out there. FedRAMP on steroids is the best way I can describe zero trust. But that is an approach of comprehensive attack. Now, why does that matter for blockchain and the immutability of blockchain? Right? Blockchain gives you that ability on a one to one level to make sure that only Aaron can share with Alan this data, or Alan was the only one who accessed this data in the respective chain. And I can revoke access to that data or that element or that whatever, you know, as appropriate because I'm up the chain, I'm the one asserting permission. So if you think about things like identity, right? Now let's look at a specific use case, what you were speaking about. If I want to make sure that Aaron truly is Aaron, and I have a zero trust assertion to go into the blockchain that, yep, this really is Aaron. So write Aaron Miri into this chain. You're downstream. You are the hospital. You want to make sure that I, I really am patient Aaron. That's no fraud going on. There's no mistaken identity because we don't have a unique patient identifier in this country. If you trust the data, it has immutability, meaning it couldn't have been modified. It couldn't have been inappropriately accessed. It couldn't be maybe Aaron with an E versus two A's, right? A, A, Ron. So you have to have that trust factor, that immutability factor say, okay, now as a hospital, now you're the hospital, Alan. Now you can accept me as a patient. You can bill for me accurately. You can tell the, per the payers that truly this is Aaron. It's not fraud. It really is his insurance information. And if you look at that chain of custody component, right? I'm trying to paint this as a very broad brush strokes. Now you're able to trust and provide care and transact on a one-to-one -one level. Now, where this gets complicated with blockchain and Ethereum and others, energy requirements, right? The complexity of scale when you have millions and millions and millions of patients, auditability, that audit trail, who's doing the audit trail, so there are still things to work out, which is why Ethereum and more modern blockchains make that simpler and less of an energy transaction. But the reality is we proved this out at UT Austin. So I, I ask all of you to Google this, what do we did with UT Austin, Bell Medical School, and using the homeless population of Austin, Texas, where I was before, to manage their identity. The problem we're trying to solve was frequent flyers to our emergency department that were either drug seeking or other issues. They needed other help but they didn't have identification on them. So how do we deal with the 50,000, 60,000 homeless individuals in Travis County, where Austin, Texas is, in a way, and also be able to share that identity across all the hospitals regionally in that area, so that if we know someone presents, this is really Aaron, these are the conditions he has, this is his identity, this is what we know about him. We could quickly help them faster. We proved that we could do it. We proved that we could do it. Now, at scale, it's complex, and we're getting there, I think, and there's a specific use case for that, but the reality is it's doable. The reality is you need immutable technologies like a blockchain. And the reality is, is that as compute gets cheaper and more widely available, as energy costs hopefully continue to lessen, we can do complex blockchain transactions at scale and get there. Bitcoin is the greatest example of that, right? Greatest example of what happens at scale when you get it right. If you can do it with money, I guarantee you can do it with identity and other needs in, in healthcare. Let me ask you, Aaron, like, what are the kinds of barriers to this happening faster? I guess I think it probably needs the killer use case for it, but like, is, is there a reason why we haven't seen this kind of explode in terms of identity and healthcare just yet? I know there's like, yeah, like so, energy and all that, but. Yeah. So, so putting, putting, putting the technical uh, limitations aside, right. And, and those sorts of things, I think one of the biggest limitations that's understanding is, is actually people understanding yeah. the why, the how, right. Will this save me money? Will this save me time? The answer is yes, because if you can assert identity, 
do you really need that many people registering Aaron? Do you really need that many people in patient accounting services? Do you really need that many people in the billing department? Because now I got it, I got it right. So I think what's happening in healthcare is these conversations are now occurring because money is tighter and margins are lessened. So folks are willing to go on an edge. The reality is, Josh, you know this about healthcare. People aren't going to change with things that have been going well all this time. Like, why am I going to tip the, 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 the ship over, right? Guess what? COVID tipped the ship over for all of us. So we're having to pivot quickly. So I think what's going to happen is, and I predict in the next five years, you're going to see a massive uptick of people wanting to adopt advanced technologies like this, which then cause people to want to invest in startups leveraging blockchain because they're solving the problems. And the ROI is clear because I can no longer hire 50 people in the registration department or whatever it may be, right? So now we're at the point where the environment of operating, the operating environment itself is different. COVID helped us there. COVID helped us, and it was a horrible thing that occurred, but from a business perspective, COVID helped open the eyes of everybody that the way we were cannot be the way we are, and more importantly, cannot be the way we will be. And that's why this role, you see the rise of the chief digital officer, why it's becoming more common, because they need people who are thinking like this saying, how do we make, how do we crack the walnut faster, better, cheaper, smarter? That's what they're asking for. So, you know, you brought up some of the work you're doing in AI a bit earlier, and obviously with ChatGPT, I guess the interest in, in AI in general has exploded. Um, you know, I think the most common use cases we're hearing about, of course, are typically it's been generative for tackling inbox or for documentation. I'm curious from your vantage point, are, are those the, the killer use cases of the next you know year or two, or are there other use cases that you're really excited about that a lot of people aren't, aren't talking about? Yeah, so not to date the podcast, but yesterday, the new HTI-1 rules from the Office of National Coordinator, so I also serve on the HITAC. Alan, you kind of alluded to that, right? I'm co-chair of the HITAC. We help write these rules about algorithm transparency. The issue that was holding back clinical killer use cases, to use your, your, your terminology there, Josh, uh, was trust in the data. We talked about earlier having those conversations with physicians and practitioners to get them to, to let go of their app. The same thing occurs with an AI uh, algorithm to output to say, hey, uh, patient Aaron could have a, a metastasized tumor or whatever it may be. Physicians and clinicians and practitioners have to trust the data, have to trust the output, have to trust what's going on. So you haven't seen too many use cases adopted in medicine because nobody really wants to put their license on the line without understanding, how did I get there? The rule that was released yesterday requires transparency into those algorithms that are deriving patient care, quality, et cetera, et cetera, and states it very clearly. So now it's a legal rule. It's a final rule saying you have to do this. Now that those guardrails are starting to come together, they're not fully baked, but starting to come together, now we can have the clinical use cases that are truly next generation in the care setting. In the absence of those, the safest place to play are things like revenue cycle, administrative overhead, operational throughput, all these other items, prompts for the responding to patient messages. Great. No one's going to get injured by that, nor should they. But in the mindset of patient safety first, which is the right thing to do, you have to have these guardrails in place so that companies and organizations can have freedom to operate knowing what the rules of the road are. Ask yourself this, would you really drive from say California to Texas on interstates with no speed limits, could have potholes, don't have any guardrails, and you really don't know if the road's gonna end and just drop off the face yeah. of the earth? Think about it, would you really go drive it? Probably not, unless you're a daredevil, right? Maybe, but the reality is once we start establishing those componentries there, people now can safely drive from point A to point B, and more importantly, take these leaps of faith and practitioners, now have the ability to innovate and say, how can I make my patient well faster and use technology like AI going forward? Large language models are only one form of AI, guys. Remember that, right? Everybody's like, oh, ChatGPT or Bard, those are great, two thumbs up. Think they're fantastic tech. AI has been around since the 50s, right? It's been around for a hot minute. So the reality is there's a number of different types of machine learning and AI that can be applied for all, care, all the care continuum. That's where the conversations we need to start having. Can I ask you, so, I mean, part of the conversation is the idea that, you know, a lot of the models, let's say at least for the large language models, are going to be essentially reach the same set of quality in the same endpoint. And so really the value is in the data itself. And so you could argue that, well, that's not really great for startups then, but it could be really great for health systems because you, you're amassing all that data. So if you're able to build more of your own stuff in-house, 
maybe I don't even know if you need startups at some point that are leveraging AI because the models are in some ways commoditized. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Um, and if that means you might end up doing more work with like a Microsoft and OpenAI as opposed to the next startup. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So I think, as I said earlier, startups are able uh, to pivot quickly. Uh, they're able to go a lot faster. Microsoft and these other companies are fantastic. We're big partners with Microsoft, big partners with a lot of folks. So I'm not talking ill of them, but they're very complicated beasts that can't pivot and maneuver and move as fast as say a startup. So if I'm a startup, I'm a couple of things. Number one, I get very close to a handful of health systems that you get to know really, really well. Remember one health system is one health system. Sure. There's some common problems like length of stay and prior authorization and things like that everybody shuffles with, but Baptist Health is very different than UT Health Austin, which is very different than Children's Dallas. I'm talking about my lineage, <laughs> where I came from. So each of them had their own complex and idiosyncrasies to have to work through. So get close to three or four or five health system CIOs, solve problems through a straw, don't boil the ocean, go fast on their data, help them be successful, do some sort of revenue sharing or saving sharing split, prove your model works, then rinse and repeat over and over again. And you will go a lot faster than some of the large big box players that are out there that simply have compliance and legal and this, and what's my ARR forecast and what's this QBR and you know, whose territory is this? Who cares? Go fast, speed to value. That's where startups shine. That's what I encourage you to go after. And you'll find CIOs out there like me in the healthcare community who embrace that and say, let's go, go big or go home. I love well, that. So I, I apologize though. You're going to get a lot of uh, emails <laughs> from startups yeah. now. I already do. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> well, Heron, um, speaking of speed to value, one of the initiatives that you've already kind of brought up already was this low code platform that you've built all this suite of tools for providers to build their own technologies. I'm really curious to double click into that a little bit. How did you arrive to that decision to let people build their own products? And what's the response been so far? Great question, Alan. So this is a fun story. So uh, when you first arrive at any organization, you go on like listing tours and you start listening to folks, right? Well, one of the d departments I spend a lot of time with is our training team because training team touches literally everybody. Everybody goes through training. Everybody has got to get, you know, CME credits. Everybody's got to go through and, you know, be updated on the newest whatever. So you see a lot of clinicians, a lot of nurses, a lot of folks. So it happened that I was in class one day with our trainers and it was a group of brand new nurses who had just graduated, who are at Baptist going through orientation and getting their, you know, how, how Baptist is Baptist, how you use Epic at Baptist, all these things like that. And several of them are like, hey, how do we code? How do we write our own app to do X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, that's interesting. So then rounding on the units one day, I was at our Baptist South location with one of my teammates. We walked into a nursing unit, right? One of our med surge units. And I had a group of nurses there standing around a computer going, God, I could write an app to do this faster. And what they were doing was complaining about how long it takes to inventory crash carts, right? Oh. Crash carts are literally what you wheel in when the patient's crashing and has all sorts of medicines, has the paddles, the whole nine yards. And they were doing it manually. They're like, oh, I could write an app too fast. I'm like, you could write an app. What do you mean? Like, oh yeah, you, you do these things online. And they went to a few websites and showed me drag and drop. And I was like, okay, I have new nurses coming in that are hungry to code. I have existing nurses that see problems. They're like, man, I could write an app and be done with this. I don't want to ask IT, it'll take too long. And like, well, why don't we try this? And so we literally tried it with that existing group of nurses, right? Our about the South location and said, let me show you how to use a very GUI based drag and drop low code platform with data that's trusted and HIPAA secure and compliant and all the things and say, here, why don't you decide what it looks like? And we're sort of phone a friend. So I'm going to be at arm's length, but you're going to do it. Took one day of okay. training. They were off the races, wrote an app within a week. They've written eye-washing station apps, crash card station apps, neonate tracking apps. They've written all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, okay, let's expand this. We expanded the physician enterprise. I just told you about the AI prompts. Clinicians, practitioners know where, no pun intended, skeletons are buried. They know where the problems are. Why are you standing in their way? Granted, you gotta give them a safe platform with safe data and give a freedom to operate with guardrails. Why would you say no? And more importantly, why would you not let them do these things? Now, the counter argument I hear from my peers is, well, Aaron, now we got to maintain it and update it and keep it secure and patch it and everything. Guess what? If you do this on a very limited basis in terms of your monitoring and measuring and you empower your end user to do those things, it becomes their baby. No one wants to see their baby become stale. Nobody. And could it be forgotten on an island one day? 
Maybe if you have sprawl and you don't control it and you don't have good governance, but if you have good governance, good oversight, good partnership, and more importantly, trust, they'll take care of it. And you're really just watching that going, yeah, great job, guys. That's awesome. So I give all the credit in the world to our clinicians asking asking for it. It wasn't some eureka moment from Aaron, like, oh, I'm going to do this low-code platform and roll it out. If you listen and you respect what they're saying and you engage them the way they want to be engaged, guess what? They trust you and they'll do it. I love that. Aaron, can I ask you, so, you know, every great innovation has both a great product, but also great distribution. I'm kind of curious. So when, when your clinicians are building these, these apps, do you end up investing in marketing and distribution across the system so that other folks are using it in other units or, or, how, or is that more of an organic thing that gets spread? One of the low code apps that we built, my training team built was an education platform and we build what's called bytes. So like 30 second videos to one minutes tops. We do everything from how to use the EHR to how to develop software on the low code platform. So we distributed Bytes, the health system. They have Baptist owned devices that we push the app to and they can watch the videos like YouTube, basically watch their own videos and whatever else. So we pushed it that way. We push it via organically word of mouth. We push it in training rooms. We put flyers up. Nursing created what's called uh, Barton, right? Named a very famous, famous nurse. Barton units, these are innovative units willing to go sort of on the edge and try different things. We have a culture of innovation across Baptist Health. If I, I kid you not, if I didn't know better, I would have thought Baptist Health was in the business of commercialization the way we think about things, mm -hmm. right? And the building IP and getting you know IP asserted to us. We're not. We're in the business of taking care of patients, but the culture here is primed to think different. And not just that, it's a locally governed giant health system. So everything we're doing is for this region. It's not like we're beholden to corporate sitting in some office, you know, six states away. We're here. So what we build and what we produce helps Jacksonville, helps North Florida, helps Southern Georgia, helps our patients get better, helps our neighbors, helps each other. So this is hunger that perpetuates. So when you do something like this and listen to your practitioners and give them what they want, the outcome at the end of the day benefits themselves. So it's amazing that so many times you hear, oh, what IT did to me, in this case, it's what we have done together to build together for tomorrow together. It's a very different construct. And to what I was saying earlier, it does take a lot of conversation and partnership, but I'm telling you, the more you do with that, the more it sort of perpetuates and I can take a half step back. Like you guys got it, like roll, you guys got it. Yeah. I love that. Also, I suppose, you know, those, those providers would be building something in Excel or you know, other applications anyways, they were. if they wanted to. That look at, look across your health system and say how many access databases you still have, or how many Excel sheets, how many nurse handoff reports are still on Excel or sitting on someone's inbox. I mean, <laughs> for gosh sake, they're building it anyways. Give them the tools, do it safely and securely. Right. So Aaron, last question that I had, you've been involved in numerous programs to teach future generations. I heard a story back in, I think 2007, 2008, you took a Chime boot camp. And you said, you know, one day I want to be teaching this boot camp. Look, and now you have, you have taught those boot camps. So I know you're currently a, a DHA candidate, which is really exciting well, to see. And so I'm curious, how do you see the role of mentorship and education in shaping the future generations of IT professionals in healthcare? So one of my longtime mentors who now was like, this is how life works, guys. So, so 20 years ago, I worked with a gentleman who was the president of our main campus in Dallas. I was an IT manager and ended up being a lifetime of friendship and mentorship. And now he's a CEO here at Baptist Health, Dr. Michael Mayo, and I work for him as a CDIO. It's just, just how life works, guys. So so the reality is his ethos, which, which I admire, is always give back and train the next generation because we're relying on them. And he did that with me as I grew up in my career, and I'm now giving that back to the community. So number one is always give back, whether it's teaching in Chime Bootcamp, whether it's to the point I'm going to get my doctorate right now, I'm about a year away, all these things continue to better yourself, better others, and lead by example, right? So that's step one. Step two, help encourage and evangelize to others to believe in themselves they can do it. How many people have held back from everything from professional cert to getting an advanced degree because they thought, I just can't do it, I don't have enough time. If I can do it, and so I tell my team all the time, if I can go back to get my doctorate, right, with all the things I'm doing and find a way and still be there present for my kids and my wife and all these things that are going on which are important to me, then how is it you can't, right? You can, you make the time in life for what's important. So that's step two, evangelize, encourage people to make those leaps of faith. Last but not least, make it easy. 
One of the things we did here at Baptist was we invested in several programs enterprise-wide across the entire IT team where they can get technical certifications or whatever. So we bought into sort of all, all you can eat carts of the way people can go get whatever cert they want, project management, Python, what take your flavor, whatever you want. Encourage it, make it easy to access, help them. Partner with your organizational effectiveness departments, your HR departments or whoever to bring in formal training, right? Bring in mentorship and leadership training, whatever it may be. Give people the ability to. Now, I can only lead you to water, right? I can't force you to drink the water. But if you make it as easy as possible, almost everybody will take you up on it because there's not a single person who doesn't want to better themselves. It's usually their own self-doubt and their own inability to access that education or whatever that helps that holds them back. So that is what Alan has constructed me all the way from my mentorship and upbringing and, and my, my, one of my mentors who is now my, my leader here who I just admire to death, all the way to my ethos of the way I operate. All of that's about giving back and setting that up. And that is what the next generation leader is. And that is what's required of this seat and beyond. And that is what boards and health systems are looking for in the future. Because if we're not perpetuating that learning, including teaching those outside of your direct line of sight, like physicians, nurses, and others, then what are you doing? You're not a leader at that point. You're just a follower. And nobody wants a follower as a leader. Well said. Amazing. So Aaron, just being mindful of your time, we're going to flip over. We have what we call the fast five lightning round. So it's just okay. five quick questions to get to know you better. First question we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Drive by Daniel Pink. Oh, nice. It's one yeah. of my favorite books. Yep. Yep. Question two, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? John F. Kennedy. I think the ambition and boldness of going to the moon, uh, I would love to pick his brain on that. Yeah, awesome. Question three, would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? Ooh, super speed. I would yeah. love to be able to get around and see things around the world all the time. Yeah. I had a feeling you are going to say speed. Yeah, speed's <laughs> an value. I love it. Question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? That every single thing that uh, the healthcare in this country has been constructed around is money. And that billing systems were the predominant thing before, oh, we discovered this thing called quality and care. Yeah. Last question that we have, if you could travel back to any event or moment in history, what would it be and why? I would go back to the days of DARPAnet. When DARPAnet first came on, I would love to pick the brains of the engineers who suddenly were there in the room when you lit up. I think it was Los Alamos, and I believe it was JPL or someone like that together. And they said, hey, we have a connection in a heartbeat and sent that first email. I would love to be there in that room. Yeah. Amazing. Well, awesome. Aaron, that's all the time that we have on the show today. Thank you so much for joining and sharing some of your wisdom with us. You can find Aaron on Twitter or X at Aaron Miri, M-I-R-I. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Aaron, again, thank you so much for sharing some time with us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate everything. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.